Hello, my name is Patricia, and this is the Poetry P podcast. Now, the goals of the podcast are to create a global community dedicated to all English language short form poetry inspired by the Japanese form. And of course, to learn as much as we can about it. As the seasons of the podcast have gone along, I've often asked you what you would like to see and hear on the podcast. And sometimes you've asked to know what's going on in the non-English language speaking world of haiku. Last year, I had a full schedule and couldn't cover that. But this year, I've made time to do it. In fact, I've made it a priority. Now, I know some of you are not English language as a first language. And of course, you know that I don't live in an English speaking world. Although I do sometimes think that the Swiss could pass as native English speakers. Anyway, the point I'm making is that we native English speakers are incredibly lucky. There are very few places in the world that can't accommodate us linguistically. And so I often think we miss out on what's really happening in the non-English speaking world. So today I'm kicking off a series of podcasts on haiku in other languages. We're going to start in Europe because that of course is where I'm based. And more specifically, we're going to start with German language haiku because that's my main second language. We'll hear a bit of history of haiku in the German speaking world. And obviously we'll hear some haiku, but don't worry. I'm going to do my best to translate for you. If you are a native speaker of another language and would like to make a study of haiku in that language, do get in touch. Perhaps we can collaborate. But before I head off to the German speaking world, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. If you're listening to this in real time at the end of January 2024, you should be thinking of sending me split sequences if you haven't already done so. Your deadline is the 31st of January this year. You can send solo sequences or you can send me collaborations. I really don't mind. And if you don't know what a split sequence is, I will put some clues for you in the show notes, some links to send you off for a bit of a refresher with the lovely Peter Jastermski, who of course originated and developed the form. I have to warn you, once you get started writing them, they're quite addictive. Now, speaking of show notes, you'll find they're a little different this year. That's because I now have a membership scheme. The show notes are going to have the links you need, but those of you on the Busson membership scheme will receive a more detailed form of show notes direct to your inbox. The podcast, of course, will remain free. After all, as I said, learning about haiku, education in haiku is very much one of Poetry P's goals. If you'd like more information on the membership scheme, I'll add that to the show notes too. So, German language haiku. Let's take a dive into what's been going on in that arena since haiku came to Europe. I'm going to divide the Germanic haiku development into three periods. The first is from its beginning to the Second World War, the second, the Second World War to roughly the 1960s, and then the 1960s onwards. Germany, of course, has seen much territorial change during this whole period of time. But in essence, I'll be talking about haiku in countries that speak German, which of course includes Switzerland, where I am. It's one of our official languages. There are four, in case you didn't know. Let's not forget that Europe came into contact with Japanese culture from about the mid 1500s when the Portuguese arrived in Japan. They went mainly for trading purposes with a bit of a side gig in missionary work. The Japanese were not too keen and kicked them out. And then the Dutch came along. And he Hendrik Dorf, a Dutchman, potentially wrote the first haiku-like poem, 
probably around the end of the 18th century. This was his poem, if you haven't heard it before. Lend me your arms, fast as thunderbolts, for a pillow for my journey. Lend me your arms, fast as thunderbolts, for a pillow for my journey. There is documented work which suggests that in the German-speaking world, there was interest in Japanese poetry from the mid-1800s onwards, when August Fitzmaier, great name, August Fitzmaier, made the first German translations of Japanese short-form poetry. In this instance, he was translating Tanka. And his book, if you want to follow it up, of course, there'll be a link in the show notes, was the Beitrag zur Kenntnis der ältesten japanischen Poesie. Now, that interest ramped up after the World Fair in Paris in 1896. Stefan Wulschutz asserts that this is where the perception of haiku as a special and separate liter literary genre began. Although, if we're to give credit where it's due, the French really led the way with regard to haiku in Europe. Is this the first haiku in German? Eine Wasserrose, die aus der Tiefe auftaucht, kräuselt sich das Wasser. Eine Wasserrose, die aus der Tiefe auftaucht, kräuselt sich das Wasser. And that's by Paul Ernst, who published it in Polymeter in 1898. But I do, of course, have a translation for you. And I've tried to translate it in a more contemporary style. A water lily emerges from the depths, rippling water. A water lily emerges from the depths, rippling water. Now, this water lily poem was published sometime before the poem we're all familiar with. Ezra Pound's A Station in the Metro. The apparition of these faces in a crowd, petals on a wet black bough. The apparition of these faces in a crowd, petals on a wet black bough. And that was published in 1913. But even before Pound wrote this, the Germanic world continued with their interest in all things Japanese. Sabina Sommerkamp suggests that with Japan's victory in the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, interest in Japanese culture may have seen another spike, as it may have awakened a feeling of intellectual affinity and identity in Germany. Shall we have a look at some of the poems being written in this pre-Second World War period, which can be linked back to haiku. Hans Cantius travelled to Japan between 1914 and 1920, and as a result, wrote poems based on his idea of haiku, on what he'd learned there. They're often overlooked because they weren't published at the time. I don't believe they were fully published until they appeared in the anthology of German haiku, which was edited by Sakanishi, and that was published in 1978. So an example from Kansius would be Lauter, sing dein Lied. Wind, schucht, frühling und blüten. Der Mond weint im Ried. Lauter, sing dein Lied. Wind, schucht, frühling und blüten. Der Mond weint im Ried. And I'm sure you'd like to hear a translation. Lute, sing your song. The wind chases away spring and blossoms. The moon weeps in the reeds. Lute, sing your song. The wind chases away spring and blossoms. The moon weeps in the reeds. That was Hans Cantius from the 1920s 
translated by Patricia Maguire. If you look at that, you'll see that we can recognize that as something haiku-like in terms of contemporary haiku. It talks about a season. It's very much about nature. It's in a form that we'll recognize, if you look at the German anyway, as 575. And from what I can see from Mr. Kansas's poetry, he does tend to stick to 575. But there are rather too many verbs for my liking. What do you think? Now, the next one is by Reina Maria Rilke. He took a very different view. He was very, very excited by the idea of haiku and wrote this one to one of his friends at Christmas 1920. Kleine Motten taumel schauend queer aus dem Buchs. Sie stürben heute Abend und werden nie wissen, dass es nicht Frühling war. Kleine Motten taumel schauend queer aus dem Buchs. Sie stürben heute Abend und werden nie wissen, dass es nicht Frühling war. And the translation? Small moths tumble shuddering across the box. This evening they die and will never know that it wasn't spring. Small moths tumble shuddering across the box. This evening they die and will never know that it wasn't spring. A haiku written by Rilke in 1920 and translated by Patricia Maguire. I think perhaps he got himself a little bit overexcited, don't you? That first line alone, whether in English or in German, could be the length of a modern day haiku, couldn't it? Let's move on. Maria säugt das Christkind und hinter ihr an einer Schnur blähnt sich im Wind die Windeln. Maria säugt das Christkind und hinter ihr an einer Schnur blähnt sich im Wind die Windeln. And that's by Franz Bly in 19. 25. And a translation for you. Mary nurses the Christ child, and behind her on a rope, nappies billow in the wind. Mary nurses the Christ child, and behind her on a rope, nappies billow in the wind. And that's a haiku by Franz Bly from 1925. Translated by Patricia Maguire. Fünf Kontinente zittern, wenn der Kornpreis steigt, und nicht, wenn du weinst. Fünf Kontinente zittern, wenn der Kornpreis steigt, und nicht, wenn du weinst. And that's by Ivan Gol in 1927. And a translation for you. Five continents tremble when the grain price rises, and not when you cry. Five continents tremble when the grain price rises, and not when you cry. A haiku by Ivan Gol. Translated by Patricia Maguire and dating from 1927. I find this one very interesting. It's a very interesting time in history, isn't it? And I wonder, is this one of the examples of the first social history haiku? We see quite a lot of them today. But I didn't see many when I was doing my research. Now that gives you an inkling of what was being written from the late 1800s through to the Second World War. 
Yet, as the war began, a very important book, as far as German haiku is concerned, was published. Ihr gelben Chrysanthemen. A book in which Anna von Rottauscher translated the work of the masters. Of course, we're quite familiar with some of the works therein. Flog da ein welches Blatt zurück zu seinem Zweige. Ach nein, es war ein Schmetterling. Flog da ein welches Blatt zurück zu seinem Zweige. Ach nein, es war ein Schmetterling. And that, in case you were wondering, was Moritaki, translated by Rotasha in 1939. And if we translate it, it would be something like this. Fallen blossom returning to the branch. Oh no, a butterfly. Fallen blossom returning to the branch. Oh no, a butterfly. That's Moritaki, translated by David Laspina. I knew that one by Moritaki. But reading through Rot Rottausche, I got to learn some new ones, and I thought I'd share this one with you. Der Effu rauscht in herbstlichen Wind. Der Effu rauscht in herbstlichen Wind. And that's my Kakai translated into the German by Rottauscher for her book in 1939. And if you'd like a translation, of course. The leaves of ivy, all of them quiver in the autumn wind. The leaves of ivy, all of them quiver in the autumn wind. And this time that was translated by Hoshino Tsunihiko and Adrian Pennington. Now, of course, this book didn't come out at a very fortuitous time, did it? 1939. We're probably all aware that the world was to be in uproar for the next six years. And even then, even after that, it wasn't really stable for some time. Yet this book was to have a considerable influence in the German-speaking world. Next time, we'll enter the realm of the post-war era and find out what influence Anna von Rottauscher had and where that took the German haiku world. So I hope that was interesting. I hope that this poem spoke to you as poems should. My particular favourite was Franz Bly's poem about Mary. The idea of the Virgin Mary having to wash the nappies, it really brings home that Jesus's family, should they have existed, had to engage in the mundane, despite being related to God. I'll read it for you again in translation. Mary nurses the Christ child, and behind her on a rope, nappies below in the wind. Franz Bly, written in 1925. So, thank you very much for joining me today. There will be links in the show notes so you can do some follow-up reading if you so wish. The poems will also be in an essay I'll publish after next week's podcast, so you can really dive in and study them yourself. However, you can read them along with me if you go to the YouTube workshop and watch the video. Probably should have said that at the beginning, shouldn't I? Don't worry, I am going to get my hair cut. So next time, it won't be in my eyes. Now, remember, I am waiting with bated breath to read your split sequences. But if you want a refresher, there's a link in the show notes. Peter has spoken quite extensively about them on the podcast in the past. I'd be very grateful if you let me know what you think of the translations. Email me and let me know. Translating is a minefield of problems, 
but I'll go into that a little bit more later in the year when I hope to can collaborate with more translators. So until next time, keep writing. And of course, if there is something you'd like to know that isn't in the show notes, send me an email and I'll do my best to help you. Ciao.